Hi, and welcome to Web Piano Academy. My name is Antonella Di Giulia, and I'm a concert pianist and music theorist. So in this live interview, we will have as a guest Dr. Robert Strauss, and we will talk about what it takes to become a singer and start a career in the music world. Dr. Strauss has been praised for his sensitive, intelligent interpretation, his attention to musical and textual uh, nuances, and his uh, versatile tenor voice. Since returning to Western New York in 2004, Dr. Strauss has become increasingly in demand as a singer, teacher, conductor, and stage director. And so welcome, uh, Dr. Strauss. Just a second, I put the uh, Web Piano Academy logo down here. And here we go. <laughs> Hi. Hi, welcome. So uh, let's talk about you, what you do, and um, how, how did you start your own career? Oh, my goodness. Well, that, that could take me the whole hour. As you said, I'm a tenor, and tenors do like to talk about themselves. Yeah, um, of course, yes. <laughs> so um, I'll start with today. I, I, teach at, I teach voice and, and producer of opera at SUNY Fredonia. Um, so I work with uh, private voice students. They are music education majors. They are music therapy majors. They are sound recording technology majors, musical theater majors. So lots of different kinds of singers uh, that I work with. I also am the vice president of our chapter of the National Association of Teachers of Singing. So I get to interact with a lot of different voice teachers from across the state. And I'm also artistic director of the Buffalo Gay Man's Chorus which means that I wave my arms in front of singers. And sometimes um, when my friends and colleagues agree to it, I've waved my arms in front of you <laughs> um, as well. So, uh, so that's what I do. How did I get here? Um, it's a fascinating story. Well, well, someone asked me very recently when I started singing and I said from birth um, that, that I just always you know, made noises and, and performed and so on and so forth. But but my path was normal other than that. In the fourth grade, I joined yeah. chorus um, that led to doing uh, musicals in high school and singing in chorus in high school and, and deciding that I really, I really love this. I really love the way that I can communicate with people um, as a singer through song um, and decided to major in music education, um, doubled in vocal performance, and then uh, went on to get further degrees, my master's, uh, my doctorate in vocal performance and literature. And along the way, I've done a lot of things. I've sung in musical theater productions. I've sung in operas. I've given uh, classical art song recitals and uh, the whole lot. So I'm sort of, <laughs> in a way, I can talk about what it is to have a career in singing because I've had so many different versions of it. Right. Along the yes. way. And, and, and frankly, that's that's a part of what it is to be a musician. I'm sure your other guests have talked about this, yes. is that it's doing lots of different uh, related things. Right. So when you were a kid, mm -hmm. did, did you know you just like did you imagine a career in singing or a career in music in general or what did you want to be? Oh, my goodness. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, I thought I was going to be a math teacher. Uh -huh. I knew I wanted to be a teacher, so I got that part right. Uh, yeah. But I was going to be a math teacher. It wasn't until so I was I was working as a stock person in a in a grocery store, and I was on break. And it was my junior year of high school, I think. And uh, one of the cashiers who was in college already uh, was talking to me, and what do you want to do? And I said, well, I've always, I thought I was going to be a math teacher. I want to be a math teacher. That that was my plan. But I, I've been in the musical and I, and I really loved that. And I always loved singing. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do in a career in music. How do you make money? So right. well, what am I going to do? And she said, well, why don't you be a music teacher? Why don't you do music education? <laughs> and, you know, the sun came out, the clouds parted, and, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, so, it is not like... Want, yeah. Uh, sorry for yeah, yeah it is uh, like being a teacher and doing also what you love right so uh, teaching music yeah right? yeah, yeah for sure but it's uh, i like to think of myself as a very smart person i i i don't know why that hadn't occurred to me before that point um yeah. but 
but for for sure that's that's when it happened yes yes and uh so how how did you train like that that's interesting to everybody because everybody has a different background uh, and um comes to music basically through sometimes uh, through a good teacher sometimes through trials and errors uh, and yes sure Sure, for sure. And and some people uh, decide that they want to major uh, in voice at college and they've never had a private voice teacher before because they've worked with their high school choral director or, um, you know, that sort of relationship along the way. I think to a certain extent it depends, or I know to a certain extent it depends on, on exactly what you think you want to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, there are some different things that I would say if you were a person who wanted a major in musical theater, I would say, right. well, get some dance training, get some acting training. Um, if, you, if you're thinking, if you're more classical, if you're more interested in being a church musician, if you're more interested in singing in a chorus. But I think no, no matter which version um, or versions I haven't mentioned, um, it would be to find a good voice teacher, um, establish that relationship and start working with them so that you can develop um, uh, a really healthy vocal technique. Um, right. One of the one of the tricky things I'll say, um, singers as singers were really good at poor me. You know, I'll talk about how I always have to carry my instrument with me no matter where I go. <laughs> you know, luckily you don't have to carry yours, although you bring your fingers with you no matter where. Yeah, you go. not the grand piano. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you know if i go to a party if i go to to a barbecue if if i'm um even in the grocery store i have my instrument with me so it's important that i have really good habits and good vocal technique and i didn't i didn't really start studying voice formally until my junior year of high school yeah. so at that point i was probably 16 15 yeah. 16 i think um, at that point. And so I had 15 years of using my voice without really knowing exactly what I was doing or how I should do it. Mm -hmm. And and of course, singers, well, I shouldn't say of course, this may not have occurred to everybody listening, but if you've ever recorded yourself, if you've ever, if you've ever been on a pad podcast and listened to that podcast and go, that's what I sound like, <laughs> um, we hear ourselves uh, inside our heads so differently from what the actual sound coming out of our mouths is. And that makes it tricky. It makes it difficult to establish good techniques because maybe I want to sound like Pavarotti. Maybe I want to sound like George Michael. Maybe I want to sound like Sam Smith. Um, but if I sound like any of them inside my head, I probably don't sound like them at all outside my head. And I'm probably manufacturing and manipulating the sound and, and creating tensions to try to create that sound inside my head that isn't healthy um, yeah. and isn't appropriate. And then I don't even sound like what I want to sound like. So having, wow, I have a long answer to this question. I'm so sorry. I have a very long string. You know, those dolls who talk and you pull the string and they talk. I have a really long string. Um, but it's important to, to find that relationship with somebody you trust who will tell you, okay, this is what I'm hearing and this is what you need to do to do it in a more healthy manner or to extend your range or to expand your volume or to be more resonant uh, because you need that person externally, um, right. as with any instrument to be sure. But I think with voice in particular, because you just don't hear it uh, the yes. way that everybody else does. Yes, yeah. especially because it is a personal thing. You know, you you have that that instrument inside yourself, and yeah, yeah. And you and you yeah. can't change change it up. You can't. Oh, this piano is awful. The action is terrible. Oh, I don't right. like this brand of piano at all. It's like, well, this is what I have, and I can't trade up. Right. I was uh, just talking about that uh, with uh, one of my adult students yesterday, and I suggested, good, you want to sound like Barenboim in the the sonata. You're playing the sonata beautifully, you want to sound like Brian Boy, then you need to record yourself. Because I don't think you're sounding like Brian Boy, and uh, I think you are thinking that your sound is perfectly beautifully uh, produced like Brian Boy would do, but it is not exactly the same. Now, I suggested him to so, uh, take uh, um, a recording of Brian Boy, like listen to that, then record yourself and compare it and see 
what is the difference? Because the recording will tell you the truth. And yes. inside of our ad, we are always perfect. We, we, you know, we play the entire piece. And at the end of the piece, we've forgotten what we've done in the middle, right? So, so by the end of the piece, we have that satisfaction. Oh, yeah, I played it up to the end of the piece. That's beautiful, right? I uh, accomplished something. And uh, but then it doesn't sound really, you know, in the details like it should. So recording yourself, I think it, it's a good thing for pianists, too, because uh, we are so busy producing notes and moving our fingers or reading the notes yep. that you don't really uh, listen to yourself and to the sound you're producing. I, yeah. I, I remember when I was a student, I used to kind of uh, play blind. Like uh, I, <laughs> I had the lights off uh, at times or kind of I put something uh, on my eyes so that I wouldn't see yeah. like a blind person would. And then I would play so that I could just hear what I was producing, right? That's fascinating. No, that's a great idea. And you're exactly right, because when we're when we're making the music, our brain is occupied doing a lot of things. And so we 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 can't listen. I mean, we, we do, but we're just not able to take in and evaluate the information. So so that's brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, how would you suggest um, you know, if a student would come to you and start taking voice lessons, how would you suggest to train the voice uh, uh, in a way that is really kind of healthy for them? Uh, because I know many students uh, make that mistake, they force the voice, uh, they go in mm -hmm. out of range, uh, they sing too high or too low without training that properly. So, and that's very dangerous for the voice then, right? Yes. Yes, for sure. Well, again, I think it's it's finding finding a teacher that you that you trust, um, finding a teacher that you um, th that you know they know what they're doing. Um, but but certainly, I think that we all start with the same um, ideas about um, breathing, uh, about making sure that you're you're breathing low and wide, um, that you're not creating extra tension in the throat uh, around the larynx. Um, in the articulators, the jaw, the tongue, um, to make sure that the breath can travel freely um, and that you are uh, feeding feeding the tone, the breath appropriately without, as you say, pushing on it. Um, uh, I talk a lot in the beginning and throughout about a posture and alignment and, and mm -hmm. physical tensions because, you know, yeah, Technology is wonderful. And I almost said that a moment ago when you were talking about recording, because so many of us with our smartphones carry around the technology that allows us to record what we're doing so that we can go back and, and listen to it. But um, I make fun of myself all the time for my head position when I'm at the computer, my head position when I'm playing piano, because I'm not a pianist. Um, I get by, I fake it okay. Um, but in particular, when I'm looking at text or looking at something on my phone, I hang my head down over um, in front of my body and that creates extra tension in the back of my neck, um, which can steal freedom um, from, the, from the larynx, from the vocal folds. Yeah. It can steal resonance space from me. And it just, in general, it can radiate down to where uh, the breath support comes from that I'm just not able to do that freely. Uh, and then another part of the answer to your question is, is there's a certain amount that depends student by student because, you know, every, when I get them, you know, they're 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 and beyond. Um, they've been singing for a while and they, they've had ideas about how they do it. And different people have different good ideas and different <laughs> people have different bad ideas. So, you know, it, it's figuring figuring that out. And and I also say that sometimes it's like, um, I don't want to imply that I'm a baker, but I do bake sometimes. And I know that you'll mix the wet ingredients and you'll mix the dry ingredients. And sometimes the singer comes to me, I, I'm sure it's the same with piano, yes. that they have, that most of what they're doing is okay. But part of what they've, the way that they're doing it is like a little bit wrong. Like, They've got a nice open space. They've got a nice free jaw, but their tongue is pulled back a little bit. So it's sort of like you've mixed your dry ingredients together and everything's right, but you've added a teaspoon too much salt. And so now we've got to get in there and pick the extra salt out because we don't want to throw the whole thing away um, because most of what you're doing is exactly right, but it's got this little 
And that that's the tricky yeah. part of, of what we do as teachers, I think, is like, okay, we're not, we don't do it completely differently, but you have to just not do that little part of what you're doing. Right, but I think for singers especially, I mean, I'm lucky, let's say that as a teacher, as a piano teacher, I, most of the time I start with the little ones. I start with right. them when they are four, so they never played the piano before. Right. So when they start uh, with me and they are four, I teach them the good habits right away. Right. The problem with me is when they come to me after they played for a certain number of years, uh, with a teacher who didn't take care of that all by themselves or oh, watching YouTube videos, right? Which are right. awesome, but uh, you know, you watch a YouTube video, you don't really know your posture, your hand position, all those things, how to produce the sound. And it is so difficult then to really kind of uh, establish good habits after a while. So uh, for boys, it, it is a little bit more difficult because we talk and speak since we, we were born. Exactly. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 And screaming for our parents to to come get something, or you know, I think all the time about. Um, I talk to my students because when we breathe, we shouldn't move our shoulders up because that creates tension. But if you go to an elementary school choir show, you know which ones are going to go on. You know which students are going to continue to sing. They love it so much. They're the ones who are breathing like that. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I just did that for the podcast, people. I raised my shoulders when I uh, when I breathed, and I looked really enthusiastic. But you you know you know those children um, who do that in the elementary school chorus, and because they think that they should, they think that that's what they they should do. And and yes, it's it's there's a a good bit of what we need to do as teachers and as singers is unlearning some of those things that. Again, if you're if you're on a playground screaming for your mom, that's that's one way of using your voice. And if you're singing, waving through a window in Dare Evan Hansen, that's another way to use your voice. And they're both yeah. effective in in what you're doing, but but it's it's not the same, even though it's the same instrument. You know, yeah. it's sort of like we can we can bang on all of the keys of the piano to get our class's attention. It's not good right. for the piano. Don't do that. Um, you know, but but that's not the same thing as playing a Beethoven sonata. At least I know that much. Yes, but um, so now the voice is one part of singing, right? Yes. And then you have all those different aspects uh, and starting from developing and correcting your personality, for example, or kind of uh, um, uh, developing a discipline and developing being good habits for your body, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to be healthy to be a singer. Otherwise, if you're sick, even though you have a beautiful voice and you can sing, if you're always sick, then you're not really going to have any kind of career, but that's for anything. And, and, and all those things together, okay, okay, listening to music, uh, listening to others, uh, developing that sense for harmonies. And uh, I think that all those aspects are, um, are what then, make, make uh, uh, a career a little bit easier to uh, for a singer, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, a career in singing is difficult. And I, in, in the sense that, yes, you have to uh, develop good habits about um, stretching, about um, exercising your body, about uh, what you eat and how it affects you, and what you drink and how it affects you. And uh, you know, how you use your voice in everyday life. Um, I don't mean to just be talking about Broadway, but but the Broadway singers sing eight shows a week, or perform eight shows a week. Yeah. And so when they're not in uh, rehearsal or performance, they need to not be, um, they need to not be going to big parties where they have to yell over, um, over the crowd to be heard. They need to uh, m be moderate in, um, their use of whatever affects them. You know, some people it's sugar, some people it's caffeine, some people it's dairy, um, alcohol. Um, allergies um, are can be a big problem, and that's not something that you put into your body, but being aware of what, how your body responds to what's blooming right now um, mm -hmm. is, is a big thing. And sort of, again, uh, not just having a voice teacher, but also maybe having a medical 
team. That sounds very fancy. I'm not sure that <laughs> we would normally call them a medical team, but making sure your doctor knows that you're a singer and my doctor knows that I'm a singer. So when I, you know, I, I've said this all along, you, it, my, my mother and my sister, if they get a cold, they, they aren't singers. So if they get a cold, they can still go to work and yes. they can still communicate and, and do their job. You know, there, there comes a point, of course, where you should stay home. And we know that mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, but if I get a bad cold, I can't do my job anymore. Um, or I can't do it as effectively. Or or there's a, there's a threshold where um, my mother and sister can still do their job, but I can no longer do my job. I'm, I'm now sick enough and they can still go to work when they're that sick, but I, but I can't. Right. So... Yes. So it's learning all of that about your body and, and being willing to make the sacrifice. You just talked about personality. And as musicians, especially in this day and age, we have to be entrepreneurs. We need to um, sell ourselves all the time. And, you know, I, I'm an extroverted introvert. Um, I, love, I love to say that again because it makes me sound uh, <laughs> fancy. Um, but I have to work against the introverted part of myself um, to in this career, I need to put myself out there. I need to um, tell people that, you know, I need to show up for auditions. I need to create auditions. I need to uh, do all that. So, so that's a challenge. I lost the train of what I was talking about. But anyway, uh, I know that I was talking about my doc. My doctor knows that I'm a, a singer. And so w when I say I've got this going on, um, he doesn't think that I'm a hypochondriac, or at least he doesn't tell me that I am. He understands, and then and then when I'm performing a lot, I need to I need to go home and shut up when I'm not performing or, or right. selling myself. Yeah, I, I had a, a friend of mine. Uh, he's married to Violetta Romana, who is a, a mezzo soprano, and uh, I went to, to visit him uh, once when she was performing in New York City at the at the Metropolitan Opera, and. Uh, um, so she, uh, he said, well, I can come and uh, meet with you, but Violetta is home. She cannot talk today <laughs> because she had a performance at night. So for the entire day, she was really kind of uh, quiet. She wasn't saying a word because she had to perform, uh, I think it was Aida. Uh, you know, it, it, it right. is a three hours opera. So, you know, you have to have your voice there. Um, to be able to perform for something. So it, that requires a lot of discipline, mm -hmm. a lot of mental toughness, let's say that, uh, to be able to really control all those aspects of your life, because that's your instrument, that's your career, that's how you make money, right? Yeah. And it, it is very difficult, I think. Um, so it, it, that's why possibly, even though somebody has a great voice, but it doesn't have that aspect, right? That mm -hmm. kind of type of um that person is not ready really to make all those sacrifices then it is very very difficult to really have a career right it, it does it takes so much discipline you know about how you how you use and warm up your body how you use and warm up your voice as you say that's it, that on a day when you've got a big big three hour long opera to sing um you need to be really smart about how you're using your voice but it's also about every day, you know, it's because what you do on, on the days that you're not performing can affect you when, when you are, if you're not, if you're not keeping it moderately in shape, um, you know, much like, well, I don't know why I'm thinking of Hugh Jackman and Wolverine. I think I just, I heard him in an interview because he's a music yeah. man right now on Broadway, but like, you don't just the day before you start filming Wolverine, oh, I'll go to the gym today. Right. And then all of a sudden you've got the muscles in the right configurations. The same thing with, with anybody who does professional sports. You, you, yeah. you know, certainly you don't always need to be in tip top shape. Um, maybe not every day you're prepared to sing Aida, but you need to be doing enough that, that the, the muscles are working properly, that you're, that you're not bringing in bad habits. Um, so yeah. that on the days that you do, it's not such a long distance that you have to travel. So yes, as you say, it's not just the performance days that you think about how you're using your body, how you're using your voice, what you're eating, um, how you're interacting with people. I do remember a story, I think it was Deborah Voigt, who's a, another mezzo-soprano, um, who sings at the Met and she was talking about 
how she was pulled over on the side of the road and she told the officer that she she couldn't speak outside. Yeah. I can't imagine I can't imagine how much courage it took to say that to a police a police officer because yeah. I mean, it, you know, I never get pulled over for speeding. I, I don't want you to think that I do. But in the rare occasion where it's happened for some reason, I would never be like, well, well I can't I can't step out of the car right now. I can't talk to you outside. Um, but that's something that she needed to consider and and was really, really important to her. Right, right. I know, I know. Also, Violetta doesn't really kind of take the um, uh, subways uh, or all those things because of uh, cold germs, all those things that can affect her career. And then, and then it makes sense then at the end, because if you are not able to sing, then, you know, your contracts will uh, go away and you don't have money all of a sudden. So how do you want to restart a career if you're not serious and professional about all of all those added things, all those other aspects uh, of your yeah. life. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And of course, as, as you work, you learn what your, uh, your, what your voice and your body can handle. So it's not, it's not exactly that as a singer, I live my life as a monk all of the time <laughs> um, or that, but I just, there are, there are certain things that I know that I need to be conscious of um, and certain things that I, I do need to avoid almost completely. Um, and then okay. when I am performing that I need to, that's when I'm more of a monk. And yeah, yes. as you say about Violetta, I'm I'm staying home and I'm not talking. I'm vocalizing yes. throughout the day, um, getting those muscles stretched out, but I'm not overusing those muscles. No, let's imagine that uh, somebody has already done all this work uh, and then has uh, finished college uh, and, you know, you're, you're a voice major somewhere, have your master's degree um, in voice performance. How would you plan your career? So uh, now, obviously, depending on, you know, uh, in what kind of genre you're singing, uh, mm -hmm. what is your main interest, but uh, what would you suggest to somebody who is just starting? So like a young singer who has a great voice uh, and, uh, you know, wants actually to work in music, what would you suggest? Great. Well, I, well, aside from the training, which I, which I've talked about uh, a little bit or a lot, depending on <laughs> how you think about uh, the speed at which I, I speak. Um, but I, it's also about making connections. Mm -hmm. And so find, you talked about somebody who's just finishing their master's. They are probably looking at um, young artist programs and uh, who, who runs them and who attends them, um, singing auditions for the right people. When you when you're when you're ready, when you when your teachers and your team are telling you that you're ready, okay, your techniques put together, you know what kinds of roles, what kinds of repertoire um, you're good at, and you're, you're expert. At it, then it's then it's networking, um, yeah. and that's that's where the introvert in me fails, um, as far as that goes. But but singing auditions and and working with people, and so that brings up an interesting topic, uh, because there's this sort of stereotype of the operatic diva or the pop music diva who is um, nasty and mean to everybody and doesn't treat people well, those people, they don't really last in the business. Right. Um, if they have phenomenal talent, phenomenal talent, one in a billion, maybe they do. Right. And so maybe that's where these stories are coming from. Um, but you really need to be a good colleague um, right. you know, I've had people tell me that, you know, we hired you to sing the small role in the opera and we loved working with you and we loved, um, the way that you interacted with people. You were such a great colleague. You were a benefit to the whole production. And so now we're, we're calling you to come back and do a larger role right. in the next production because we loved working with you in that way. And that's a really, that's a really important thing to do, to be, yes. I don't want to say to be a good person, yeah. Um, or, the, and that's an interesting thing to be humble because you need to have confidence. It's so hard to get up on stage. We know that it's so hard. You need to have a certain amount of confidence to get on the stage, but it needs to be presented in a way that that isn't. It, it's pumping you up, but not putting other people down. Right. When, yes. When you do that, um, and you can be you can be as arrogant as you want to when you are at home in your bedroom by yourself. <laughs> um, and no one can hear you, but when you're, when you're working with other people, yeah, I think humility is so important and, and just being, be, being a good compliment I, or, or being a good colleague. It's so, 
what we do as musicians is so, I want to say insular, we're so isolated, okay. you know, in what we do. And there's the, there's the competitive nature of what we do where, yeah, I go to an audition and, and this is the role that I'm looking for and they're going to cast one person. Yeah. yeah. So it sort of is a competition, but it doesn't mean that, that I should, in fact, it's better if I'm, the other people who are up for the same role, if they do something well, I should tell them they do something well. Um, right. And and hopefully they'll tell me if there was anything that I did well. Um, it, but it's just, that's networking and being a good colleague is, is a huge part of it. Once you've got yourself put together, once you know what it is that you're, what you're good at, what you're capable of, um, then, then yes. And, and, doing the auditions and doing the young artist programs and um putting together programs on your own yeah I, when i when i finished the conservatory and then the academy in italy i had one of my teachers so um carla giudici who uh said to me i was asking her to her so like what do i do now like i finished right. my studies well i didn't know anything about my phd all those things i wasn't right. dreaming about coming to the states at all at that point so i was in italy and i said to her what should i do now like how do you organize all this knowledge in a way that will keep uh, me up in my career right i will continue then on my own maybe um and she said you just you should practice every day as you have a concert, like yes. prepare that program. And then at one point, just look for opportunities all, all, all the way along. Just look for opportunities to play, opportunities to play in competitions and concerts, but keep practicing as those opportunities are already there. And I, I, I remember uh, listening to Lady Gaga at one point uh, um, saying something very, very similar. I, I, so when she was at the beginning of her career, she started thinking of herself as that person who she wanted to be. She mm -hmm. wasn't there yet. And she was already saying, I'm already famous. I'm already a singer. I am, you know, who she wanted to be. And, right. uh, and I think having that plan in mind uh, might help um, and not only singers now at this point, but everybody out there who is in music, because we don't really have a plan. We have to invent ourselves and sometimes we have to invent our opportunities, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that that's exactly true. It's so it's good to know where you want to go, who you want to be, if uh, like Lady Gaga. Um, that's great. Um, but also, like I said, I I'm a singer. I I, I want to sing my career path has been lots of things for sure, and but I knew what I wanted to do, but I wasn't opposed to conducting a church choir. I wasn't opposed to singing in the chorus of, uh, uh, or singing in a symphonic chorus. Um, and, and that's where, one, I met people mm -hmm. um, who could, in, who were the people I needed to talk to or could introduce me to the people I wanted to talk to to further my singing career. Um, it helped pay the bills, of course. That yes. was important too, but also kept me stretching those muscles. Um, yeah. I, it gave me little goals until, you know, until I'm singing at the Grammys. Well, that's not going to happen tomorrow. I, I need to I need to warm up today because I'm singing in the chorus of the Beethoven Nine. Right. Yes. Um, and and that's keeping me stretching those muscles. Or, as you just said, creating your own opportunities. Um, putting together a program with friends and colleagues and finding a, a, a venue. Um, I've done that numerous times. I, I've done it lots. And sometimes those are my favorite things to do, as a matter of fact, yes. where it's just singing, singing what I want to sing with who I want to sing with. Um, uh, and just, you know, seven people might show up. I I like it when it's more than seven, but seven <laughs> people might show up. But but I put in this work, I'm, I'm working with with brilliant people and we share ideas and, and we, we affirm each other's talents um, and strengths. And, you know, instead of just waiting around doing the auditions and waiting around um, to get cast, if that's your path, I mean, for all of the listeners, I hope for you that, you know, you, you get the training and you go audition for your, your first Broadway show or your opera or, or record company and you immediately get the role or immediately get the deal and never have to um, wait for somebody to say yes to you. 
But for those of us who are human and have had to wait for those opportunities uh, to materialize while doing auditions and while doing um, different programs, putting together my own programs has, look, I, I know people who just sit around and wait to be asked, you mm -hmm. know, who wait to be asked to sing this program or to play this thing or whatnot. And it's really hard in those situations to keep your skills up. Right. Because you're the motivation. Um, some people are super, super dis disciplined, and that's wonderful. But I think again, most of us are human, and it's easier to have that discipline when there's when there's a short term goal. If I'm singing a recital in two months, I will be practicing. If I'm generically practicing for this role that might happen in five years, that's harder. Yes. Um, so, so again, you know creating opportunities for yourself. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you're a member of a local church and the church will let you use the space. Maybe, you know, there's there's some cool, uh, I don't know, a, a coffee shop that, that's that got right. a fun like Aria night. I, I don't know if those exist, but yeah. uh, my I, head think, do. I think as a singer, you, ha you can create more opportunities. But for example, as a pianist, I need a piano, right? Yeah. So I, I need a place where there is a piano. As a singer, you can go outside. Uh, I don't know, sure. you know, sing in places where, for example, for other instrumentalists wouldn't be possible. So as right. a singer, you you are there and you can still just create those things. But um, what I, I think is missing for most musicians, not only singers now, is that mindset of being an entrepreneur, like uh, of being your own uh, boss and being your the creator of your own business, right? It, it is a business what we do. It our is. career, our career is a business, and then uh, and so as a business owner of you being a musician, a singer, or whatever you you are, then you have really to have your business plan. You have to have your short term, long term, and then you know years uh, from from now goals uh, in order to achieve those goals. And even though th th those goals might never become a truth, right? Mm -hmm. They never be there. But then you have a path, and you can change the path according to what's happening there. Uh, you're, you're going to be, I don't know, in a different country at one point. Good. Okay. So I adjust my goals according to the country. Uh, it's it, it, funny to mention that I, when I was a teenager, um, I, I did those things, right? I had my short term, my long term, and my dream. My dream was to be in the United States at one point. That was a dream, like something impossible at that point. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, here I am. <laughs> and uh, but by writing down, uh, you already have a certain path and orientation, and then you can say to yourself, "Okay, good. So I'm practicing because I want to um, have a recital in two months, three months from now. And if that doesn't happen, it's okay. You might still have that in four months or in two months, right? In a different form, maybe. But you are still kind of working towards that goal and try." you are still trying to create that opportunity for yourself. For sure, for sure. And and, and the whole, the entrepreneurship um, in this day and age is, is tricky. I, you know, I feel, so, so much has changed recently. Um, you know, we're, we're online more, um, social media, um, as, as far as that goes. So it's, it's so important for people who are really serious about a career in music, to really keep their finger on the pulse of, of what is necessary. Do, do I need a website? What does the website need to have? What, what can be on there? What should be on there? What shouldn't be on there? Um, I, I remember not that long ago, people were cautioning us, no, don't, don't put videos up on the internet unless you're sure that they're great because the internet lives forever. And I think that's, that's still a part of, part of the truth. But it's also true that for people who are really serious, it's possible that if you're not putting stuff up enough, you, you know, I think of like Facebook and TikTok and, and YouTube and all of that, that it, the shelf life of anything, that, it, that if people are going to see you, 
you need to be putting material out and and marketing and and what what does marketing look like in 2022 versus i think even 2012 i i kind of hate to say it that way because i want to say well 2022 is different than it was in 1992 which is true but marketing and entrepreneurship in 2022 really probably is a lot different than it was in 2019. Yes. Um, so making sure that, you know, as once you've gotten the the training and, and, and you're ready to put yourself out there or you're getting ready to put yourself out there, look, looking at what that is all about and, and learning that. Yes. Because yeah. when you get cast in the Broadway show, when you get cast in an opera, when you get your recording contract, then you've got people doing that for you. Yes. that they have a marketing team, that they have the people who are updating the website and so on and so forth. But, but I, think, oh, I think also oh. that right now, I mean, if I would look for to hire somebody for a concert or to, I don't know, unless I know that person personally and, you know, I know what they do and how they play, how they sing and how they behave, how they work with others, I would look at online. You know, that's that's a natural thing to do to, today. You Google uh, the name of that person. You look at what is out there. Um, do they have something? If somebody has nothing, really nothing out there, like how can I trust that that person is actually what they say they are? Exactly. Exactly. And that and that's, you know, that's that's been a little bit of a shift. But look at all the things like at my age, look at all the things that I've learned about lighting for when you're going to appear on um, in an interview yeah. and, and making sure that the, the lighting is right. That's not something I studied. That wasn't a part of my doctorate. Um, how to how to do audio settings um, for for online. But now people are doing they're submitting video auditions. So it's really important that not just your musical product is good, but that you okay. look good doing it, that you, you know, that the recording is as good as it can be so that, you know, and that, and that's tricky um, as far as that goes, because I remember scouring my house for a blank wall so, <laughs> that, so that I could have a blank wall. I mean, for, for those of you who can see behind me, I'm in my studio at school and I've got beautiful artwork and posters beautiful. from students and, and, and beautiful things. And I love this backdrop for, for this sort of thing. But if I were doing an audition, it would need to be more blank so that they're really focused on just me and, yeah. and scouring that with a good lighting and without, um, without, you know, the neighbor's kids screaming and interrupting or my dogs um, interrupting uh, the recording and, and all those things that, that frankly, when I um, walked out with my doctorate were things that I had never considered. And, and yeah. so it's such an important part of, I mean, certainly entrepreneurship and presenting myself, that was important, but the way that we do it these days is so very, very different. And as you say, if I'm, if I'm looking to hire someone, if I'm looking to engage someone and I don't know them personally, if I've yeah. gone through my list of friends, cause that's where I always start. So make friends with people. Um, then, then yeah, I'll go, I'll go online. Even, even taking recommendations of good friends, I'll still want to hear them. Yes. And yeah, know yeah, that yeah. they're that they're capable of doing what I, I want them to be able to do. I, I invited a few um, professors uh, that I knew from conferences for, for this podcast. Uh, and uh, I know for sure that as soon as they received my email, I started kind of uh, going through the YouTube channel and seeing uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, live streams about uh, what are those about, what is she talking about? Uh, I know they do that. And right. uh, I also saw uh, a people I was in touch with going through my website and visiting all the, you know, because through the analytics, obviously I, I can see those things, but that's the way that we do that today. And obviously if you have things out there that are not reflecting who you are, then you have to take care of that. Right. Yeah. So, so you have, yeah. Oh, it's, it's so important. I mean, I remember talking about head shots, you know, people would take and they'd, and they'd get these like really glamor shot uh, done up, uh, pictures, but it didn't really look like them. So, you know, but by, I think what you're talking about is the other extreme where like it, it also doesn't look good enough. So you need to, you need to make sure that you know how to represent yourself as a musician, but that it's really you. 
Yes, yes, that's your company. You are your own company now, so you have to take care of yourself and then of what you put out there. And then, so how, let's say that, I, I, I am a young singer now. Mm -hmm. uh, like, let's imagine that I can sing back in. But, uh, so, and uh, <laughs> I would like uh, to, you know, organize a cool program and, um, you know, start kind of, working on that. I know I know uh, you do a great job with the Buffalo Gaming course uh, and uh, with all those uh, productions that you do. Uh, so uh, let's say that from that role that you have, mm -hmm. what would you suggest um, uh, doing? Like, how should I organize my own things in a way that it is effective, beautiful, entertaining at the same time. I know that your concerts are very kind of uh, entertaining and okay. funny. And I, I think I think it is beautiful because sometimes we forget that we don't really go to concerts to really sit and like like we are in the church and listen to a sermon, right? Like sure. we, we don't go to a concert with that mindset. We go to a concert because we want to have a good time. We want to have fun and we want to enjoy beautiful things. It doesn't matter then if, you know, the music is sad or happy, but we want to have a, an environment which will give 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 to us uh, a wonderful experience and will create beautiful memories for us, right? Right. Well, that's that's a lot, actually, I think. We could probably talk for for hours. We could have a whole series on how to put together a program, um, but I think, or I'll try to answer a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and and actually, I'll think because I am I am putting together some some of my own performances uh, right now, and I think, you know, I start with what do I want to sing? Mm -hmm. do, do I want it? To, is there a message that I want the program to have, or is it just I'm just performing um, that can that can help me narrow it down um, a little bit who's my audience is important yeah. or who do I want to be in the audience because if these are people who are used to going to rock concerts um, I need to it's not about the repertoire particular but the pacing of the program mm -hmm. um, that, that's so important um, what's what's the length of the program again sort of related to the audience um, I don't think any of us can sit for two hours in that kind of concert anymore. Um, or I don't think I could sing a two hour one, but no. but is an hour too long for for what I'm doing. So so thinking about what I want to sing, what the audience uh, can handle, uh, what the length is, I need to think about because I I love a heart wrenching, passionate, uh, despondent, um, overwrought text uh -huh. you know and and so typically those are really the the slow heartbreaking songs but no audience member can bear to sit through probably even five of those in a row <laughs> yes right i uh, right. love singing them but it's important you know in figuring out again maybe there's a theme to the program and and there's a story you're trying to tell and so figuring out where you are in the story um i i always related to human emotions because we're so complicated even if i am feeling overwrought and despondent mm -hmm. you know i uh, i didn't get cast in that role i auditioned for so now i'm i'm at home with my ben and jerry's ice cream sitting in the dark well i'm going to be i'm going to be sobbing loudly i'm going to be laughing at myself for how ridiculous i look sobbing loudly i'm going to be sitting silently eating the the ben and jerry's i'm going to be angry at the world and yelling so like over the course of a minute and a half i'm going to do that so figuring out how within your program you can vary the moods and the tempos and 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 the styles but how it's still it also has to be kind of unified so that you're not singing like you know to sing a lady gaga song followed by a charles ive song followed by a monteverdi piece in italian <laughs> the styles are so disparate that it's hard to jump from one to the other mm -hmm. from the audience's perspective so figuring out I mean, there might be a way to link it. I feel like really clever people have done things like that and made it work very well. But you need to think about that as well, about how right. how it, it all works together. I 
when I'm doing mine, I do always start with a, like a theme or, or a storyline. I find that really <laughs> fascinating, but I don't think that's something that all singers have to do. And then it helps me make the decisions about what I have to cut. Because right. when I'm picking out a program, here's some advice for everybody. Um, your programs are always going to be too long. <laughs> You're always going to have way too much repertoire that you want to perform. And so I, I can't remember who it was, an old time movie star who said, you get dressed for some event. And as you're about to walk out the door, take off three or four accessories. I'm getting the, <laughs> I'm getting the quote wrong, I'm sure. But the idea of it is, is, you know, I always start a program with way too much repertoire. And here's what I want to do. And here's what they want to do. And here's what I think they should hear. And here's this, you know, 17 hour long concert. Um, and then, okay, but here's the story I want to tell. This doesn't fit the story anymore. This doesn't fit the story anymore. I love this song. I'll do it some other time. Um, and, and narrowing it down and then looking at, okay, well, here's like 17 slow songs in a row. I need something either funny or faster or, or I'm sad too long. I need to be angry um, and, and figuring out all those things. And, and I'm sorry I got so passionate. That's one of my favorite parts <laughs> of, of uh, the performance. I've talked with friends about this, one friend in particular who feels exactly the same. We do love performing. I love performing, but it's, I almost enjoy putting the program together more. Then yeah. once I get to the performance, I'm like already thinking about the next one that I want to do and, and you know, the songs that I scrapped. Um, right. So, and, and, and so that, that is the beginning of it. I don't know if I answered the question you asked, but I yeah. know that I answered a really cool question. So yes. um, if you need to reel me back in, let me know. No, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, and then uh, once you get that program done, right? Now it is a performance thing. Like mm -hmm. you have uh, to, really organize the performance act as is I, I i i think of myself as an actor when i'm performing yes right because yes. you are you are creating that i don't know that show you're telling a story yeah. yes you tell a story you have to impersonate the storyteller and you have to consider the audience as almost a, you know like in the way that speakers do you know, I'm yeah. talking to them and I'm singing for them. I'm playing for them yeah. and I'm creating this beautiful thing. And which also at, at times we forget that, but um, it, it also includes all the things that the audience would experience from the moment they come in to the moment they go out from that concert, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the way, I love that you said that because yes, I am in character. Um, whether whether I'm in an opera or a musical or it's a recital and the story that I'm telling is my own, you you you're. It's not that you need to force feed or spoon feed your audience, but but we always tell stories through music. That's that's why it's there. The composer was responding to something, um, and and wanted to wanted to share this emotional journey through through the music. And we need to help our audiences to be ready to go on that journey. So the way that we come onto the stage from the moment we're first seen um, is so very important. And it's why sometimes I drive people crazy thinking about the placement of the piano or the lighting, where are we gonna stand? So the light's hitting us the right way so they, they can see what, what we need or what the background is, or sometimes you have no control over that. Right, And right. especially yes. as we're talking to younger performers, if you're performing in a church, you can't, you probably don't have the funds or the time or the resources to build a set um, to to create the background that but, you need. But uh, even a very simple thing, so that, uh, I mean, organizing the chairs in a certain way, or yeah. like uh, having a, uh, placing yourself in a certain way, entering the stage in a certain way. Uh, you know, do I enter from the back, from behind the audience? Do I enter from the right, from the left? What do they see when I'm yeah. entering the stage? Um, so uh, in those terms, I think, especially for a singer, uh, it is important to think of yourself as a stage director uh, and then yeah. say, OK, what am I wearing? You what know? are you wearing? So right. important. What is the color? What is the color of the you know the whole i'm singing that hall uh they have red carpet they have uh, mm -hmm. i don't know uh, yellow chairs so what am i wearing that i don't 
it, like I fit with that kind of in that kind of environment. I maybe I might not wear red if the red is red, the carpet is red. Exactly. Right? So that you stand <laughs> out, so that they, yes. it's easier to focus on on you, yes. uh, as opposed to that, or you know, putting some flowers out, or if you're not allergic to them, or <laughs> yeah, just the 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 whole thing. Absolutely. Yes. What what they're what they're looking at it because. Although we think of ourselves often as an audio art, um, when we're performing live, it's visual just as much, you know, yes. and, and, and keeping in mind those things are very, yes. very important. And, and as we already talked about the, the marketing, how, how are they going to find out about this performance that you're doing? Um, oops. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for example, designing the, uh, some posters, so designing the flyers and designing the programs you know mm -hmm. that's that's part of the entire experience and then people we get attracted to that and then we come back over and over and over again i had a, an experience with a singer once uh, uh the, there was a paying audience and at one point he stopped the concert because he had it. <laughs> uh, uh you know he couldn't sing anymore and I, I was shocked because it was a paying audience and i i mean I would probably, if I would have been in the audience, I would have asked for the money back at one point, right? right. You, I came here, you just, uh, you were just singing two songs and you stopped the concert. It's not possible, right? So I'm not going to pay that much money for yeah. to to hear two songs. But you know that diva attitude is what then creates the audience not to come back, right? Uh, I'm a diva. I can do whatever I want. Uh, I don't care that you pay the ticket. So that's not what the audience wants to uh, receive. They're paying and I really want, um, let's say that if we go back in time, musicians were serving the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that attitude should still be there because we are serving the audience. It doesn't matter if uh, you sing or play in the church or you sing and play in the opera. You are right. still serving an audience. You are kind of providing a service uh, for to uh, so th these people are going to be entertained. That yeah. that's why they pay the ticket. They don't yeah. want to, yeah. They don't want to hear uh, of I don't. Oh, I'm sick today. I'm so sorry that you came here, but I really cannot perform. <laughs> so yeah. they they're not coming for that reason. And then uh, and. Uh, from that point of view, we just need to be serious about our profession and say, okay, so that's uh, that's who I am, what I do. If I cannot do that, I'm not going to perform. I'm going to cancel the concert rather than providing a bad service, right? Right, for sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that goes to that sort of goes again to being a good colleague, and that has to extend to your audience as well. Unless yeah. again, you get to be the level of um, I'm trying to think of somebody, you know. So, Certainly, humans do like drama at times, and so maybe there's a mystique. Maybe some of these stereotypes of the divas were manufactured because it was interesting that there was a feud between this one and that one, and <laughs> that you know the whole um, um, Callis Franey feud right. that they they probably just you know met up on weekends and, and drank martinis and had a had a good old laugh but yeah. when they were out in public there was this mystique of this feud and and all of that but but for most of us for most of us normal humans we, we don't have that that level of um again sort of mystique or intrigue people aren't that interested in us so, yeah. so we need to be not just good musicians but but good colleagues and good human beings and and the like I like that, and I would love to end uh, uh, this uh, interview with those words because it's beautiful. <laughs> As I, I think, I think uh, uh, when I met great musicians, they were always great human beings, and that's yes. uh, yeah, and that's yeah. what. Uh, should stay with us as uh, so as excited to talk to us, so excited that we en enjoyed their performance. Yes, one hundred percent. Yep. I thank you so much for being with us today, and I hope you had fun <laughs> having this interview. This That's is cool. also part of how I planned uh, my own career, right? So that's part yep. of my business plan. And uh, thank you so much for being part of that. Uh, and I hope to talk to you in the future again. Uh, Absolutely. This live streams. Thank yeah, you so thanks much. Thanks for asking me. Bye. Bye.